but not for this reason. I'm going to mess things up today, so I'm going to be, try to be real short. Try to get you out of here a little bit early today just because of the subject matter at hand. I heard Travis comment on the love thing. At least Allison kind of tried to bring a, a balance of the love a while ago. Just for a moment, I thought she might be going my direction, but I, I finally gave up, and, and, and here's the topic. It's just going to be tough today. I'm apologizing up front. Uh, for those of you watching by live streaming that didn't come today, you can turn it off anytime, and you don't have to hear about hate. The rest of you are kind of stuck unless you want to be obvious slipping out. So don't slip out unless you want me to call your name. Ride this out with me for the next 15, 20 minutes. We ate, we ate one time, we had a whole family clan we all met at Oklahoma City at a restaurant called Molly Murphy's House of Fine Repute. That was the name of the restaurant in Oklahoma City. We had never been there before. It looked like a fun place to eat, and it was. They brought food out on wooden trays. We ordered the Bacchus Feast, and they just brought out whole roasted chickens and potatoes. It was just so cool until one of our members in the family had to ask the waiter where the restroom was. You've been there? That's from your stomping grounds. And so the waiter very quietly and discreetly said in response to her whisper, you see the big red neon light? Wait, it's, it's down there, turn in that hallway, and that's where the restroom is. So she got up to quietly excuse herself, and as soon as she got up, they began ringing cowbells. They called her out. They pointed at her as she went. It was a restaurant tradition that any time somebody asked where the restroom was, you just embarrassed them. And they just started calling out. And they, all the way to the bathroom, people are pointing at her. The waiters are they're whistling, they're pointing, their lights are coming on, going to the bathroom. That's where it's going to be today if you leave in the middle of the sermon. <laughs> if you slip out, I'm going to talk about you publicly. Man, I... <sighs> I hope the image captures the essence of what I really want to leave you with today. I know, I know Christ is love. I know the great commandment is love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. I know that. I know that uh, love is both a gift from God and a commandment of God. Uh, I know that all the gifts of the Spirit, no matter what you think about 1 Corinthians 12 and the gifts of the Spirit that Paul enumerates in 1 Corinthians 12, he washes all of those away in the first few verses of chapter 13. And he says very clearly, if you've got this kind of dynamic faith and you can just speak to a mountain and it removes itself and you have the gift of prophecy and you understand all mysteries and you can speak a word of wisdom, if you can do all this magical stuff, speak in tongues of men and of angels, but you do any of it without love, it is all pointless and worthless and meaningless. It must come from love. I know that and I get it. But today, surrounded by love, for just one moment, let me focus on the little nasty word, hate. I'll just read Revelations 2 and 6. This is the end of the story. This is Christ wrapping up the age we live in. This is the book of Revelation preparing us for a fantastic climax of this earth and the inhabitants thereof. And in his last commentary, he addresses the seven churches. And he says, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He is commending the church at Ephesus, who although he had pointed out some of their flaws and their failures in the verses before this, he wraps up with at least you know, the little sandwich psychology. I'll give you a little bit of good, then we'll tell you the bad, but I'm going to close up with a little bit of good. And now he's going to wrap up his negative comments to them about where they've missed the mark 
by at least complimenting them for this. And he doesn't compliment them because they loved all people. He complimented them because they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And he also hated them. Isn't that weird? For all of us who can only quote one verse in the Bible, judge not lest you be judged. And if we had to follow up with a second one, we'd just follow up with love. Love everybody. Love makes the world go around. Go barefoot and wear flowers in your hair and love. Well, this comes as a shocker. At least Christ says, I'm going to compliment you here. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, and so do I. So at least we got something working. Now, you probably would ask, well, who were the Nicolaitans? I'm glad you asked. I'll put it on the screen for you in case you did. The best we can find is that they might have been followers of Nicholas. We're not even sure about that. We think that's why they were called the Nicolaitans. Here's what you'll find if you go to the Smith Bible Dictionary, ATS Bible Dictionary, any of the other Bible Dictionaries, pull them out, Ungers, they all have the same thing. I just, I didn't even bother putting the print in. Just, I gave you what you need to see. Hey, they might be. They, they may have been. Uh, whether they were the same as, we don't know. Some suppose they were. Do you get my drift? In other words, no matter how many books you read, you're never going to find out who the Nicolaitans were because they simply are never described to us. In fact, the only description you might find came some 250 years later when Tertullian wrote against all heresies. And I'll, I'll share that with you. Tertullian wrote, one of the early church fathers, wrote, a brother heretic emerged in Nicholas. This is why we, this is why we think these might have been the followers of Nicholas. He was one of the seven deacons who were appointed in, uh, the, in, the, uh, the, in the Acts of the Apostles. He affirms that darkness was seized with a concupiscence, and indeed a foul and obscene one, after light. Out of this permixture, it is a shame to say what fetid and unclean combinations arose. This was written between 200 and 300 A.D. If you don't understand it, don't worry. We've changed language a little since then. The rest of his tenets, too, are obscene. For he tells of certain eons, sons of turpitude, and of conjunctions of execrable and obscene embraces and permixtures. You with me still? And unclean yet baser outcomes of these. He teaches that there were born, moreover, demons and gods, and spirits seven, and other things sufficiently sacrilegious alike and foul, which we blush to recount, and at once pass them by. We don't even give them time of discussion. We don't want to talk about them. Enough it is for us that this heresy of the Nicolaitans has been condemned by the apocalypse of the Lord, meaning Revelation. Our verse, with the weightiest authority attaching to a sentence and saying, because this thou hatest, thou holdest, thou hatest the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I too hate. We simply don't know much about the Nicolaitans, and yet we know this, Christ hated their deeds, and he commended the church at Ephesus because they also hated their deeds. <clears throat> so for us today to have any relevance to this, I, I have to ask the question again, are there any Nicolaitans now? Could, could we find any now? Let me, let, me, let me show you something cool about that passage we just read. I circled a couple of words. I, I could have circled a bunch of them that I, I figured you probably don't know what they mean because you don't use them every day. Concupiscence. Turpitude. You notice how I use it? Here was what Nicholas, one of the seven deacons appointed by the, in Acts of the Apostles, he, he believed that darkness was seized by light with a concupiscence, and indeed a foul and obscene one. He tells of certain aeons, sons of turpitude, and of conjunctions of execrable and obscene embraces and permixtures. Let me, let me just define three of these for you so you know what 
the illustrious Tertullian was trying to say. Concupiscence is from your dictionary. Sexual desire, sensual lust. Sons of turpitude, he refers to. Turpitude is vile and shameful depravity. Are you starting to follow his trend of writing now? And what he was explaining to men who understood his vocabulary? Whereas we do not. You know, they tell us that we're supposed to preach on an 8th grade level because the average person in our audiences do not have more than an 8th grade level of vocabulary. Did you know that? That's what we're actually taught. I did seminars, business seminars around the country one time for prior industries. 70,000 miles, 22 states. I taught seminars, business owners and managers all over the U.S. Coca-Cola in Atlanta flew me back there three times just to train all of their department heads and managers. And in that training process, I was taught, try not to use words beyond an eighth grade level vocabulary. So I guess that's why the machine blew up behind me. Concupiscence and turpitude stretch the ability and the function of our computers, apparently. So you'll just have to take my word for it unless they get that thing running again and concupiscence didn't blow a circuit out. Sexual desire, sensual lust. When he said, for he tells, Nicholas told of certain eons, sons of vile and shameful depravity and of conjunctions of utterly detestable and abhorrent embraces and relationships between people per mixture. Hmm. Are you kind of getting the idea what he might have been talking about? Remember my earlier question? You think there are any Nicolaitans today? I'm just going to suggest that maybe it's just possible, uh, maybe every evening when you turn on your television, can the computer find my picture up there and throw it up? There you go. We only fried one of them, I guess, on the side. With words it's never seen. Are there any Nicolaitans today? I, uh, I don't know if I'm uh, going to be able to just wrap this up sufficiently today to, to make you understand the purpose of my bringing this message, but... But it's kind of, uh, kind of odd that the, the greatest commendation Christ could give to the church at Ephesus after naming a couple of their weaknesses was not that he praised them because you just love everybody. It's kind of odd, isn't it, that he, that he said, you, you hate their deeds and so do I. So I'll give you that much. That's a good thing. I, I, I think it's fair for us to ask ourselves if we hate anything anymore. Does, does, does it shock you that more people are offended at sermons where once in a while I'll throw something out like, Hey, this guy told me one time he brought in a bunch of prostitutes and whoremongers and whores and let them just act up in his living room in front of his family. Just there, here we are. Come on in. Make yourselves at home. Just do your thing. And then he, oh, oh no, I'm just talking about the TV I turned on. But your kids are sitting there watching filth and crud and Adultery and homosexuality and pornography and lying and cheating and glorifying and backstabbing and slandering and slut and slut and more slut. And it offends people more that I say that than it does that they watch it routinely on television. I'll get emails from people because I say something a little too glaringly. And I sent one back to somebody last year 
who wanted to rebuke me because I, I used some language in a, a blog I put out. Not, not vulgar language. I use language once in a while like pervert or whore or something of that nature, which might offend you today. And I'm going to tell you what I told one person, never heard back from them by email. Send me a list of the shows you allow your family to watch before you rebuke me and criticize me for the use of a word that I'm just using to try to make you sit up and pay attention and listen for a moment. You want to rebuke a preacher because you think a preacher won't rebuke you back. Shame on you. This one will. I never have liked people that will pick on preachers much because they know they won't fight them. Well, this one might, so you might want to be careful. I told one man many years ago who came to my house to confront me drunk, you know, I could just have a Vietnam flashback on you. And, and nobody would ever mind. They'd say, oh, God bless him. He's a sweet little preacher. He just had a flashback. So just leave me alone. Don't mess with me. But more than that, if I understand the Bible correctly, it's my place to reprove and rebuke and exhort. And especially when we get lazy about the end of the world and the end of the age and the coming of the Lord and the fact that I'm just not sure but what we haven't been absolutely brainwashed into being so afraid to speak negatively against anything that we're just allowing the enemy of our souls and our families to run roughshod over us and do anything and everything that he wants to do. Does it bother anybody in this room that the president of our country just decided to put out an edict using his national power and his bully pulpit and warn states like North Carolina or Texas not only to quit trying to pass laws preventing those who think they might be the opposite sex from which they were born to use whatever bathroom they want, now he intends to, and has already sent letters out to numbers of school districts and states, now he wants to tell every school because he gets federal money that all their bathrooms now need to be transgender. And, and on one hand you think, well, if there's some little child that thinks he's a girl but he's really born a boy, it's just a shame. Perhaps he should use the girl's bathroom. Like that's going to take away the stigma because he walks into a girl's bathroom? Of course it's not going to take away the stigma. So we need to stop calling them boys and girls. No, we don't. Male and female created he, them, he. God made us male and female from the very beginning. It has been that way for 6,000 years. It's going to be that way until Jesus comes. America is not going to change the biological definition of male and female uh, d d we're on such a ludicrous and unbelievable downward spiral and happening so fast it's almost laughable if it wasn't real you'd swear it was a fiction movie being made up somewhere and now a president of the United States is going to tell every school district if you want to keep getting federal money for those students in your school which you can't survive without maybe it's time for you to understand those bathrooms need to be available to everybody now that also means a male teacher who identifies himself as a female can just go into whatever bathroom here. I, if that doesn't bother anybody here, well, God bless you. Just keep your love going. You're, you're, you're sweet. You're, you're better Christians than I'll ever be. And I hope one day God pats you on the back and says, hey, you loved everybody even when they were trying to destroy every tenet of faith and every promise and principle in the Bible, but you just kept loving them. God bless you. I don't know. God bless the uh, Lieutenant Governor of uh, North Carolina for his response to our president. God bless uh, Abbott here in Texas for his response uh, to it. And, uh, and God forgive those of us who just sit placidly by and assume somebody will fight that battle for us, and we don't have to worry about it. Somebody will fight it. Somebody's fighting it right now. 
But if they don't fight it next month or next year, who's going to fight it? If you get angry enough at what's going on in your world today, maybe, just maybe, I'm just going to throw a few things out that hatred might motivate you to do. I hate what's going on in America today. I don't hate Obama. He, he's just a, a knucklehead broken down by the spirits that have led him uh, to be whatever he is. I, I, I don't hate him. I have, I have no respect for him. But I don't hate him. I know we're live streaming. I don't care. Why don't I respect him? Because no president ever in America ever stood up as the leader of a nation and said, no matter what America once was, it is no longer a Christian nation. Why? Because you said so, sir? Because you have the power to overturn the founding fathers who did found a nation based on their scriptural principles and who came here for the sole purpose of religious worship and religious freedom. And you have the singular power to overthrow the entire foundation on which this country and its constitution was written because you say it wasn't. And the vast majority of its citizens are still identifying themselves as Christian, but you have the power as leader to say it's not. I hate what you are trying to do to this nation. You're undermining its values, its churches, its spirituality, its morals, and I hate it. And if I really hate it, I'm sorry. I can't just pick up the remote and find another channel, a little better one with another fable. If you and I could just learn that it's all right to hate. He said it was. I give you this. You hate the deed. He didn't say you hate the Nicolaitans. He said you hate the deeds. You hate what they're doing. That's what he said. I'm going to give you this. You hate what they're doing, and so do I. The reason I think that we don't know who the Nicolaitans were, and, and it's not clear to do you know if they had defined the Nicolaitans, if any Bible writer had actually told us who they were and what they were doing, do you know I think we would have said, okay, if you can find somebody doing exactly that, well, then it's okay to hate those deeds. But they're lost in obscurity. The closest we come is something somebody wrote over 200 years later, Tertullian, trying to describe the followers. Of, and, he, and he didn't do a good job for us. All he did was throw out sexual lust and depravity. So I can kind of guess what those people were about. But it's vague. That's okay. Because that, by leaving it hanging, it's God's way of saying to me, Man, if you don't hate the people that are trying to destroy your morals and your virtues and your values, do y'all do do know what's happening from, from the president down in this administration? Do you know what this transgender bathroom thing is doing? I mean, do you are you one of those that rebukes people on Facebook? You Christians ought to just get a life and move on and get with the 20th century and do something. I, oh, I know I'm going to get in my corner because you, you shamed me. Oh, I, well, I don't like Target anyway. I don't know how my wife's been surviving the last couple of weeks because, God bless her, she hadn't been in there, mainly because she asked me to drive her up there, and I, I won't. So I, I don't know how that's going to work out in the future. But I, I know our few dollars don't mean any difference. And I know they were transgender can go in there anyway, anytime, and could have before. So why did they choose to make a public statement and declare themselves? or what they are. Well, okay, if you make a public statement, I'm going to make a public statement. I hate what you're doing. Because it's so much bigger than who can go in the bathroom in a store. Here, here's just a peek into where it's, where it's going, and it's not going, it's already there. Six-year-old Johnny, your son Johnny, comes home from school where his lesbian teacher 
has made him read, Johnny has two daddies, or Johnny has two mommies. And because she's lesbian and protected by civil rights acts, she could even bring her partner to school just so everybody gets to see a living lie lesbian partner. I mean, you know, married people don't need to take their spouses to school and show them to children, but a lesbian could because it's a civil rights indoctrination. And six-year-old Johnny can come home and say, I think maybe I, I was supposed to be a girl because I don't play like some of the other boys play. And mommy and daddy can say, you, you stop that talk right now. You're a boy. And Johnny can go to school tomorrow and say to his lesbian teacher in the first grade, I told my mommy and daddy I think I'm supposed to be a girl, and they told me not to ever say that again. And the teacher can ask the parent to come talk to the counselor at school because they're violating a child's right to sexual development. And if you dare bring little Johnny to your pastor here, and your pastor says, Son, you were born a boy, you're always going to be a boy. Oh, my Lord, I could be looking at jail time in the very near future. Because that's what all these rights and passage of laws is literally, seriously, no more exaggeration, that's what they're all about, is they're prohibiting school counselors from helping a child find his true sexual identity. They must help them explore the options. And pastors and mentors and doctors and psychologists are having their hands tied by these laws. If you don't hate that, what will it take? Your son or grandson coming home from school? warped about his sexuality and wondering if he's supposed to be a girl or a boy? And you finding out, you can't even say so. You can't help guide your own child because, after all, it takes Hillary's village to raise an idiot, not parents. No, I've got no respect for them. I have zero, zero respect for them. i tell you what I do have for them. I have hatred boiling over raging in my soul for the deeds that they are doing to the generation of children God made and tried to make after his image and his likeness. And, and Jesus wasn't nice when he talked about messing with kids. He said, you would be better off if a millstone was tied around your neck. That's a heavy stone of weight. And you were thrown into the sea meaning you're going to drown at the bottom and be eaten by fishes, in case you don't get that graphic language. And he said, you'd be better off if that happened to you than for you to offend one of his little children. And this entire brainwashed bunch of politicians is doing exactly that today. I don't know, if you just get some hatred going, maybe you could write one of your senators and say, under your watch, are you going to let this president do this? How can you stand by, Senators Cornyn and Cruz, and let the president of this nation threaten and blackmail state school districts? You're our senators. Step up to the plate. Challenge it. Stop the bleeding and the nonsense from this administration. Please, learn to hate again. I know you got love. God bless you. You're loving people. Will you somewhere in the middle of all that love where you find the ability to hate the deeds? Maybe you can lecture a young person or drop a Facebook friend that's an idiot. Study the word a little bit. Turn off some television show. Maybe unsponsor a product or a store. Or you can just yawn. Channel surf until you find something good. Keep loving fables. Try to stay neutral on topics that bother people. God knows if you put out a statement that's pro-God or Bible or morals, you're going to have some friends attack you. I know. 
I've dropped some of them too because they're just too stupid to waste time on. I know this is bad language for you today. You came for nice, loving sermons from Jesus, loving everybody. I'm just going to tell you, you might be stumbling around like the Ephesians did and not getting everything right. And if you can't get everything right in life, maybe you ought to do like them. At least get this right. Thou hast hated the deeds that undermine and destroy your Christian values and morals and virtues. Do something about it. Say something. Thank you, Diane. Revelation 3.15. I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot, this is Jesus still in Revelation, still in that address to the churches in the apocalyptic era. I know your deeds, Jesus said, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either cold or hot. I'm not going to embarrass you and ask you how many of you think you're hot on fire for God. Show of hand, not going to do it. I'm just making you squirm thinking I might. I mean, I'm not going to ask how many of you are on fire today. Hey, man, I'm, I'm going to do what God wants. I'm not going to ask how many of you are cold and just don't care. Show up. Show up at church. Show up at church. Watch a little TV. Spend a whole lot more time watching TV than I ever read scripture or pray. Or... I, don't know. I don't know how you define cold and hot. I'm just going to leave this scripture with you, and then I'm going to go eat and, and enjoy my dinner and move on with life and yawn. I wish you were either cold or hot. Because you're lukewarm and not cold or hot, I'm going to... I'm sorry. I know it's a horrible day at Grace. I'm going to vomit you. I'm going to regurgitate you. You make me ill because you're lukewarm. Quote Jesus Christ. My God. Where are we today? And, and this political nonsense, where are we today? Rebuking other Christians online because they choose to make a stand. A lot of them, if you want to keep going to a store they're criticizing, go. Just don't get on there and say, oh, y'all are a bunch of idiots. Well, at least they're doing something. In their small way, they're trying. What are you doing? Lukewarm, pablum middle of the road, don't want to offend anybody, don't want anybody to not like me, want everybody to love me. Good luck on that. If they didn't love Jesus and he never offended anybody, good luck on that. I'm just going to close by telling you it's okay to hate wickedness going on around you. It's okay to be vexed. It's okay to be angry. The only thing I can find by the verses we've used today is it's not okay to be lukewarm. Stand, please. All the lukewarm say amen. No, 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 don't. I'm just pulling your leg now. I'm giving you a hard time. I'm trying to trap you. Somebody say, Lord, help our nation. Lord, help our teachers. Lord, help our schools. Lord, help our parents. Lord, help our churches. And Lord, help me to make a stand. Be strong. Remember the verse that says, having done all, stand. I quote that now and then. I say it to myself once in a while. And having done all you can do and nothing else left to do, then at least stand. The problem is sometimes I really haven't done all. I'm just using that verse for a cop-out from doing anything. Well, he just said, take it. Just stand. After you've done everything you can, just stand. I haven't done everything I can sometimes. I challenge you this week. This whole sermon today, I just want to challenge you. See if there's anything you... can you. Like, if you get a bulletin, at least Cruz and Cornyn's address is in the bulletin. Get it. Send our two senators a note. I am tired of this president, this administration, these policies. Stop! Stand up. Pass a bill again. Don't let Congress, 540 some odd people, ruin values and the morals that we have called out for the last few hundred years in America. But if none of that matters to you, just go home and watch TV today. Golf is on. It's the players. 
enjoy it. Get a nice cold drink, get the remote. Don't worry about anybody's kids or grandkids or great grandkids. Ugh. Just have a nice day. Father, I don't know how you can make us angry. I don't know if you even try to make us angry. All I know is if losing our morals and values and having our kids and grandkids shanghaied and stolen under our very noses and our right to raise them and love them and teach them your word is being stripped from us, if that isn't enough to make us angry, I, I, I just don't know if there's any possibility for us to actually discover that it's all right to hate the deeds of those who are destroying our values and morals with our kids. But if you ever get involved in our lives, please get involved in this area and teach us that it's all right for us to be very, very angry at what's going on and to hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. We'll still have much more love than we'll ever have hate. We'll still love and love and love you and love our neighbor. But we must hate the deeds that are undermining our kids. In Jesus' name, guide us to that end. And somebody say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We give the Lord a hand of praise. Father, thank you. Father, thank you.